The mistake was on our part that at independence, we did not cut that umbilical cord between us and the former colonial past. The Adebayo Adediji Lecture was instituted by the ECA in recognition of the contributions and legacy of Professor Adebayo Adediji to the socio-economic development of the African continent. He truly represented one of the best in the class of great economists across the globe. Men who are thinking ahead of all of us. It's just to go and look at Lagos plan of action, Apusha TV. It's Aradeji, the intellectual with clear analytic capacity. Professor Adediji served as the executive secretary of ECA from 1975 to 1991. He remains the longest serving executive secretary of ECA. Professor Adebay Odedeji made tremendous contributions to the socioeconomic development of the African continent. Most of the development blueprints that the African continent had had Adebayo Adedeji's footprints. For example, the Lagos Plan of Action and the Final Act of Lagos of 1980 and 1991, which remains a very remarkable blueprint for the continent. The Abuja Treaty of 1991 establishing the African Economic Community in developing also alternative development paradigms for the, for the continent, especially in period of economic crisis. You will recall that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Africa was confronted with deep economic crisis. The path to recovery and development for the continent was a very contested issue. And Adebayo Adedeji on the platform of the ECA provided alternative paradigm to the development of the African continent in the African alternative to the structural adjustment program. Professor Adebayo Adedeji also contributed to the revival of democracy on the African continent. The Arusha Declaration of 1990 of popular participation in development was to advocate for the return of democracy and governance building on the African continent. Professor Adedeji played a major role in that process. The African continental free trade area, which we're celebrating today, had its pedigree in the efforts made by people like Professor Adedeji in laying the foundation for regional economic integration on the African continent. Professor Adedeji also had its footprints in the um, establishment of regional economic communities on the African continent. Quite a number of the regional economic communities had their background work done at ECA under the leadership of Professor Adebayo Adedeji. In recognition of his contributions to the development of the continent, the lecture was instituted by ECA. Distinguished personalities are invited to deliver the lecture who have also made significant contributions to the socioeconomic development of the continent. Adebayo Adedeji Memorial Lecture 2024. But before I go to introduce our guest lecturer for today, I would like to share with you the order of proceedings. We only have one hour for this lecture, and we've got to manage time very prudently. Our guest speaker will be speaking for 25 minutes maximum. We will be opening the floor for questions, comments, and observations that honorable ministers may have. And the vote of thanks will be given by the family of late Professor Adebayo Adedeji. His eldest son, Adedonyi Adedeji, will be given the uh, vote of thanks. And we'll have a video. He's not here with us physically, but he will be speaking with us through a recorded video. As noted in the uh, video that I just played, ECA instituted this lecture in recognition of the tremendous contributions of Adebayo Adedeji to the socioeconomic development of the African continent. And this started in 2014. I'll share with you some of the recent guest lecturers on this platform. Uh, in 2021, Dr. Rob Davis, the former Minister of Trade and Industry in the Republic of South Africa, gave the lecture on the theme towards a developmental approach to the African continental free trade area. In 2022, the lecture was delivered by Paul Tiambe Zaleza. Paul is a professor of economic history and an associate provost at North, North um, Case Western University in the United States. Uh, Paul delivered his lecture on the role of human capital development and higher education in Africa's transformation. Last year, in 2023, the lecture was delivered by Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers. 
uh, Dr. Chambers uh, is the current African Union High Representative on Silencing the Gun, former President of the ECOWAS Commission, and former UN Undersecretary General in charge of the United Nations Office for West Africa. His lecture was on the theme of governance, social contract, and economic development in Africa, looking back, projecting into the future. Today, we will be having the 2024 guest lecturer of the Adebayo Adediji lecture. His name is Dr. James Mayinka. James is one of the best and the brightest of this continent, and perhaps globally, or in the field of artificial intelligence. He attended um, University of Zimbabwe, uh, where he did electric, electrical engineering, and from there proceeded to Oxford University uh, to study uh, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, and also computation. This was a time in which artificial intelligence was not very popular. It has not become the order of the day in um, the technology field. Um, is currently the Senior Vice President of Research, Technology, and Society at Google, reporting to the Chief Executive Officer of Google. He is a member of the Senior Leadership Team of Google, and he has worked in several capacities. He has advised several governments across the world. Uh, he is a Senior uh, Partner Emeritus of McKinsey and & Company, and is Chair and Director, of, Director Emeritus of the McKinsey Global Institute. At McKinsey, he advised the chief executives of many of the world's leading technology companies on technology and strategy, and he led the McKinsey Global Institute research on technology, the economy, competitiveness, and other global economic trends. He has served many governments around the world, notably the United States government. He was appointed by the, by the former President Obama to serve as vice chair of the global Development Council at the White House, and by previous Commerce Secretaries to the Digital Economy Board and the National Innovation Board of the United States. He is a Vice Chair of the National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, which advises the President of the United States on artificial intelligence. He serves on the board, boards of several organizations, including the Council on Foreign Relations. He has also served on national and international commissions relating to technology and the economy, including recently co-chairing the CFRS Task Force of the United States on Innovation Strategy and National Security. He serves on the board of several research institutes, including the MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, and Toronto. He is recognized as one of the first 100 personalities in the world on artificial intelligence. You will agree with me with this profile, that we have one of the best and the brightest on artificial intelligence who is here with us today, who happens to be an African. And perhaps on a personal note, James is my generation, and of course we share the same age. Uh, perhaps when James was growing up in Narare, I was, I was a Lagos boy running on the streets of Lagos. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you and to welcome our guest speaker for the 2024 at the Bayou Adedeji Lecture, James Mayinka. James, you have the floor, please. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you for that extraordinarily generous introduction, which I'm not quite sure I quite deserve. Uh, honorable Ministers, Excellencies, UN Under Secretary General, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, distinguished guests, I'm deeply, deeply honored to have the opportunity to be here with all of you today. I want to thank Under Secretary General Gatete for extending an invitation to deliver this 2024 Adebayo Adedeji Lecture. This opportunity allows me to share my perspective on the tra transformative potential of artificial intelligence to help power Africa's economic growth and development agenda paving the way for inclusive, sustainable growth and prosperity. My lecture today will cover four topics. First, this AI moment, where we are in AI's development. I understand there are some engineers and digital ministers in the room, so I'll give you some details. Second, the opportunity that AI presents for Africa's development. 
Third, the risks, challenges, and gaps in AI that are critical to address. Fourth, what it will take for Africa to capitalize on the AI opportunity. I will conclude by highlighting what we at Google are doing to support Africa to capitalize on this AI opportunity. For each of my four topics, I'll provide signposts posts along the way uh, to uh, help guide uh, the conversation. My first topic is this AI moment uh, and where we are. Speaking to you today on this topic comes full circle for me. The first thing I ever published was in 1992, a paper based on my undergraduate research at the University of Zimbabwe titled, Modeling and Training of Artificial Neural Networks. Even as I went on to do a PhD in AI and robotics at Oxford, and as a visiting scientist at NASA, where I worked on machine intelligence for the Pathfinder missions to Mars, I could not have imagined the dramatic progress in AI, especially over the last decade. Though it may seem as if AI burst onto the scene in the last year or so, given how much we're all talking about it now, the goal to build AI has been around for a very long time. The term artificial intelligence came into use in 1956 at the now famous Dartmouth workshop. This was a workshop that was designed to focus on how to develop machines that could simulate learning and intelligence. What followed over the next 60 years was a period of progress and optimism initially, followed by the so-called AI winter, during which AI did not live up to expectations. Real progress began in the 1990s, when machine learning based on neural networks began to work really, really well. Progress accelerated over the last 15 years as more computational power and data became available. This resulted in unprecedented capabilities in machine vision, image classification, natural language processing, the ability to do pattern recognition and to make predictions across a range of domains. These innovations began to power services that help us every day, from recommender systems to spam and fraud detection, uh, and many other business and consumer applications. While generative AI, which I'll come to shortly, has dominated popular attention of the past year or so, it's important to know that AI has been in use for quite a while and has already been part of daily life much more uh, than people realize. In fact, today, it's unlikely that you can use any form of technology in any, in any field or any arena that doesn't make use of machine learning in some form or fashion. If you use a smartphone, voice and image recognition systems, or speech to text, you're using AI. If you're using Google Search, Google Maps, or Google Translate, you're using AI, and you've been doing that for quite some time. Google's been focusing on AI and pioneering its foundational research and many of its breakthroughs for more than two decades. Our approach to developing and harnessing the potential of AI is grounded in Google's founding mission, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And it is shaped by our commitment to improve lives of as many people as possible. It is, in, it is our view that AI is now, more than ever, critical to delivering on that mission and that commitment. Now, to come to generative AI. Perhaps the most striking development in AI has been the rise of large language models, or LLMs, which provide the basis for generative AI. What underlies LLMs is the transformer a deep learning architecture that was introduced in a now famous paper by Google Research in 2017. I should, I should also mention that the transformer architecture is what actually powers LLMs, which serve and serves as the foundation for many generative AI products, including BARD, now called Gemini App, and ChatGPT. In fact, the transformer is the T in GPT. Due to a mechanism known as self-attention, transformers learn in a self-supervised way the connections and relationships between different tokens or words. 
This makes it possible to generate outputs by predicting the next word. By training LLMs on billions and now trillions of words and over long periods of time, they can generate increasingly sophisticated human-like responses when prompted. Once trained, LLMs can respond to prompts in many different domains, from poetry to science to law, without needing explicit instructions to do so. And they keep getting better based on so-called scaling laws. In fact, in December 2023, Google's Gemini Ultra model became the first to exceed human expert level on what's called the Massive Multitask Language Understanding, MMLU. This is a holistic benchmark which measures knowledge, comprehension, and reasoning across a set of 57 subjects, including law, biology, history, and so forth. LLMs can work not only with words, but also with software code, audio, images, and video. In fact, anything that you can turn into a token, they can learn and make those predictions. This is referred to as multimodality and enhances their usefulness. Because of their generality, LLMs can serve as a foundation on which you can build applications for almost any use or any domain. Indeed, many developers of LLM, LLMs, including us at Google, have created apps like BARD, now called Gemini App, or OpenAI's ChatGPT, that make use of underlying LLM models in order to do what they do. In addition, we and other developers of LLMs have also created APIs. These are application programming interfaces that allow others to build their own applications uh, and fine tune them and to build and serve whatever uses and needs they have. The race to create applications for a wide range of sectors and use cases has begun with companies large and small and from all around the world involved. So what's next for AI, at least technically speaking? Well, the next generation of models, like our Gemini 1.5 and beyond, will be even more multimodal, capable of higher levels of reasoning, memory, planning, in-context learning, and more. It will also become increasingly possible to connect them to other systems, from software and analytical tools to robots, even infrastructure, making AI even more capable and more broadly useful. Two things are worth pointing out here. First, generative AI is not all of AI. There are many other important developments and innovations in other parts of the AI landscape. In fact, my colleagues and I in Google DeepMind and Google Research are working not only on LLMs, but also on a wide range of uh, other techniques and applications that are useful in business, but also in science and tackling societal challenges, something I'll come back to shortly. And, is important, and this is particularly important as we think broadly about opportunities for the economy and for development. The second thing to point out is that it's important to note that despite the incredible progress that I just described, it is still very early days in the development of AI and many capability gaps and performance limitations and issues remain. This again is a topic I'll return to when I discuss risks and challenges. Let me turn to my second and perhaps main topic for today, the opportunity that AI presents for society and what it could mean for Africa. I've spent my entire career at the intersection of technology, the economy, and society, as was mentioned in academia, the private sector, and government, and also on issues of global development. Drawing on all of this, I believe that AI is a foundational and transformational technology that represents significant opportunities for people and society everywhere, including and perhaps particularly in Africa. I think of these opportunities in four major categories. Assisting people, powering the economy and expanding prosperity, accelerating scientific breakthroughs, and helping address societal challenges enabling development. Let me touch on each of these. Assisting people. AI is already assisting people from their everyday tasks to their most ambitious, productive, creative, and imaginative endeavors. And this will only increase. Examples range from 
uh, BARD, for example, assisting software development tasks like code generation and debugging, to tools like Read Along, an AI-based tutor that can help children learn by listening to their reading and detecting when they struggle to understand or to pronounce words. I could go on. Because chatbots like Gemini App and BARD respond to ordinary language, they can be easily used by non-specialists who lack technical skills. So for example, people with little or no coding skills can turn their ideas into software code. AI is increasingly helping people overcome barriers to information, knowledge, and opportunity. When Google started using AI to power translation in 2006, it could only handle a few languages like English, French, Spanish. As impressive as that was, it left out much of the world's population. It left out many of us. Today, thanks to progress in AI, Google Translate can now translate 133 languages, including Swahili, Luganda, Twi, Zulu, Kinyu Rwanda, Shona, Xhosa, and many more. In fact, a notable contribution for this work came from the work in our Google Research Africa Center in Accra. Access is broader than translation. It includes overcoming other barriers to communication. For example, automatic speech recognition uses AI to understand spoken words and convert them to text. Africa's over 1,500 languages present unique opportunities as well as challenges like limited data and varied writing systems. Progress on speech recognition is underway for 15 major African languages, reaching 242 million speakers, making it easier for people to use their voices to dictate text messages, emails, or other text-based communications. Next powering the economy and expanding opportunity. AI's economic potential globally has been estimated to be from anywhere between 17 to 25 trillion annually in some near future. These are trillions of dollars. Uh, with generative AI adding as much as maybe an additional eight trillion. These are very big numbers. And with this audience, that includes finance and economic ministers. I want to say more about where these gains are likely to come from, but also point out that the gains will not be automatic. Here I want to draw from research that I and many others have done, including a recent paper I co-wrote with Michael Spence, the Nobel laureate in economics, titled The Coming AI Economic Revolution. Labor productivity, a central concept in economics, is a key determinant of a country's economic growth. Improvements in productivity can occur at the level of a company, a sector, or the whole economy. As history has shown, technology, especially what economists call general purpose technologies, play a key role in advancing productivity and growth. Technology's contribution is most impactful when it occurs across multiple companies and sectors of the economy, especially the large ones and those important to national economies such as manufacturing or agriculture. AI is such a general te purpose technology and is applicable across uh, sectors and functions, including agriculture where AI can help improve crop yields, weather forecasting, development of new crops, and water use. Recent study studies show that AI is an assistive, as an assistive technology can help address productivity across a wide range of occupations, from developers, telemarketers, financial analysts, to radiologists, and also across business functions such as sales, logistics, operations. In fact, in some studies, call centers reported an improvement of 14% in issues resolved per hour. Developers completed assigned tasks 55% uh, uh, faster, and AI-assisted financial analysts outperformed other human analysts in 57% or so of the forecasts. Researchers have also found that businesses that use basic, even basic versions of AI grew revenues 40% faster and grew employment 25% faster than those that did not. And it's, this is important to particularly pay attention to given, in the case of Africa, the declining rates of productivity growth that we've seen, some of which is attributed to premature deindustrialization, work that many of you in this room and Danny Roderick and others have spent time on. But from an economic development perspective, a key insight is this. 
AI's capacity to harness vast amounts of knowledge, make it accessible, and making it accessible using ordinary language, makes it a powerful tool for broadening economic opportunity. The fact that at little initial expertise, at very little initial expertise by use is required, bridges the knowledge gap between expert employees and the rest, thereby broadening access to expertise, such as coding, language skills, or even domain knowledge that was exclusive to workers with more experience or better education. In other words, AI creates what one might call a leveling up opportunity with respect to skills and expertise. This is particularly important in places where formal education and training gaps serve as economic mobility and economic opportunity access barriers. Over the last two decades, digital technologies have played a critical role in the success of small and medium-sized enterprises like the ones that provide the majority of African employment. Through the use of digital tools, SMBs gained access to critical business functions that for decades had been either the prohibitively expensive or infeasible at small scale. Because of its wide ranging applicability and use across business functions, AI can dramatically expand such digital impacts as well as those from its own additive uh, capabilities. African entrepreneurs are already starting to leverage cutting access to cutting edge AI tools and applications, fueling the growth of AI enabled startups, focusing on a wide variety of sectors and use cases, from retail and healthcare to manufacturing. We see this with the African startups uh, that Google is supporting. For example, you know, Ethiopia's Gary Logistics, which is digitizing freight brokerage and transport services and using AI to Senegal's Lengo AI, which is launching probably the first data-driven operating system for the informal sector. At the enterprise level, Google Cloud partners like Cassava Technologies and Liquid, a pan-African technology group, are providing AI-enabled cloud and cybersecurity tools to businesses, while MoneyPoint uh, uses AI-powered Google Cloud services to provide underbanked SME and, in, and individuals reliable, with reliable, consistent financial services throughout Nigeria. Just as important to our opportunities in the public sector, some of you have already begun to apply AI capabilities to improve aspects of your public sectors. It's been quite impressive to see the example of AI innovations uh, and initiatives that ICT ministers such as Paula Ingabira of Rwanda and Sina Lawson of Togo have been driving. So as you can see, the, opportunity for, the opportunities for entrepreneurs and business, the potential to transform sectors across Africa is significant. But as I and many others have argued, the gains will not be automatic. They will require investment, innovation, productivity enhancing use, diffusion, and, ena and an enabling policy agenda. Let me touch on two other opportunities for society. One of the most exciting aspects of AI's progress has been helping to advance scientific discovery at digital speed and scale, and sticking previously intractable scientific problems and opening up new areas for development and economic benefit. Let me just give two brief examples from two different fields. Proteins are the building blocks of biology, and understanding their structure is critical to understanding diseases, developing therapies, drugs and medicines. Accurately predicting the structure of proteins has been a 50-year grand challenge. And until Google's AlphaFold, understanding the structure of each protein would normally take painstaking lab work, one protein at a time, for a few years. However, in a matter of weeks, AlphaFold predicted the structure of all 200 million proteins known to science. From the time we chose to make AlphaFold data, the AlphaFold database open source, it has been accessed by 1.6 million scientists in 190 countries, most of them in the developing countries, and many of them working on neglected diseases and those prevalent in the global south. An example from another field is in, from material science is genome. This is Google's AI tool that recently enabled the discovery of 2.2 million new crystals. Of the 2.2 million crystals, 
380,000 of them are stable, making them candidates for synthesis into materials that could be used in superconductors, next-gen batteries, and many, many, many more uses. Such AI-assisted discoveries are beginning to happen in many scientific fields. I could list many others. And Africa can not only benefit from the AI-powered scientific advances, but can also participate in their development and application to African and indeed global needs. Last but not least, let me turn to the opportunity to address societal challenges and development. As you know, the UN, uh, UN SDGs serve as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now into the future. And as you also know, the world is currently off track on more than 80% of the SDGs. The UN and many others, and indeed many of you, and including us at Google, through our research, deployment, and partnerships, have highlighted the potential for AI to help make contributions and progress on the SDGs. Take climate change adaptation as an example. Extreme weather events are increasing due to climate change, costing lives and causing devastating damage and loss. Catastrophic damage from flooding affects more than 250 million people every year. While flooding has historically been challenging to predict, we know that advance notice saves lives, enabling better preparation and evacuation if needed. Now, AI-enabled flood forecasting is helping. What we began at Google Research as a pilot in Bangladesh now covers over 470 million people in 83 countries where we're able to make predictions, in some cases as much as seven days in advance. Of those 86, 83 countries, 26 are in Africa, including Angola, Chad, DRC, Madagascar, Nigeria, South Africa, and even here in Zimbabwe. We're also seeing promising results in health, to pick another area. In Kenya, AI models are being trialed that make ultrasound uh, more, ultrasounds more accessible to lightly trained ultrasound operators in under-resourced settings. In South Africa, AI-powered screenings are helping to catch tuberculosis early, reducing spread. Let me mention a couple more examples. Our research team in Kenya is working to address food insecurity, to help address food insecurity in Africa to support the transformation of Africa's food systems to be resilient and flexible to climate and economic and other shocks. AI is helping in that. Our research team in Ghana has led work on open buildings, which maps buildings across Africa using AI and satellite imagery pinpointing locations of buildings to help governments and NGOs understand the needs of residents, plan urban development, and offer humanitarian assistance during crises. Indeed, many NGOs across Africa are deploying novel use cases for AI and societal issues. I'm proud to say Google.org, our philanthropy, has been helping to support this type of innovation and has provided almost $100 million in support to such nonprofits and organizations to exploring these novel solutions to tackle these challenges. For my third topic, I want to highlight some of the risks, challenges, and given this conference, I'll say a little bit more about the gaps in AI. As with any powerful and transformative technology, there are risks and complexities that come with AI, and that will continue to evolve as this development and use progress. Furthermore, as an early technology, there are gaps in AI's governance and in the ability and capacity for all who could benefit to participate in, uh, in, in its development, deployments, and use, and governance. Let me start with the risks and complexities. At this stage in AI's development, there's still many performance limitations that have the potential to cause harms. For example, sometimes outputs from generative AI are not factual, or our hallucinations, such as when, in response to a query on historic economic figures of a country, for example, language models might confidently, confidently invent some of the numbers. It is also possible for the outputs to be biased, often reflecting the bias in the training data that's used to train the models. As an example, if you're using an automated translation system to translate from English to a language with grammatical genders, it's important to ensure that, quote, doctors are not automatically translated as masculine or feminine for nurses. 
Countering such biases is an active area of research and we're investing in both, that we're investing in both for translation tools and our broader products. We'll work with many partners on issues like this. For example, Nigeria's Data Scientist Network on the West African uh, Speech Recognition Challenge, where participants trained a speech recognition model for Hausa, spoken by an estimated 72 million people. But even, as AI, even if AI works as intended, there are risks from misapplication and by, by users or deliberate misuse by bad actors, as well as data and cyber risks. Misinformation is, is a particularly timely concern this year in 2024, given an estimated two and a half billion people in more than 60 countries will be voting. To help address this, uh, we're developing and I use a beta testing synth ID, which watermarks our AI generated images and reliably, enables and reliably enables people to scan images to check whether they've been generated by our models. But this is just a start. Much more is gonna be required by all of us. And there's so much to do both together, both technically, socio-technically, and in other ways to address the challenges of misapplication and misuse. Let me also say something about AI and cybersecurity and what we're experiencing in our own infrastructure. As Sundar Pichai, our CEO, said at the Munich Security Conference just a couple of weeks ago, quote, AI can strengthen cyber defenses. It disproportionately helps people defending because you're getting a tool which can impact it at scale versus people who are trying to exploit systems. So this has been extraordinarily helpful to us in even securing our own infrastructure and helping others do the same. Managing this and other risks presented by AI responsibly is core to our work at Google. We're guided by our AI principles developed in 2018 to develop and apply AI in a way that is safe, responsible, and beneficial to society. But in such an early and dynamic field where AI's capabilities are advancing and use is evolving, there's so much more still to do and so much more still to get right and fix and correct and update. And this is work that we're gonna to have to do together with citizens, governments, academia, and civil society. There are also complexities around how AI will impact the labor markets and jobs. Most research suggests that more jobs will be gained than lost, and that most jobs, and, but most of all, more jobs will change and workers will be assisted by AI. However, AI's benefits may be limited if it causes job losses and workers can't find new jobs. If the workforce, lack, if the workforce lacks the skills needed in the age of AI, or if AI is implemented in a way that replaces workers instead of augmenting their capabilities. Tackling these issues of workforce readiness, skilling and supporting worker transitions will be critical. Google is advancing several initiatives aimed at this, including career certificates in fields relevant to AI for tens of thousands of Africans, and also as a founding partner for African Masters of Machine Intelligence program. This type of skilling will be of particular importance in Africa given the youthful population and likelihood that these young workers will see significant AI-related shifts throughout their careers. As I mentioned earlier, this is an area where AI will actually help given its leveling up potential, uh, which I described earlier. Now, let me turn, let me highlight some of the key gaps that could stand in the way of all, and here I mean all people, organizations, and countries, especially in the global south, being able to fully participate in AI's development, deployment, and use, and indeed its benefits. Gaps that should be on our minds, especially at this conference, and with Africa in mind. As you may be aware, uh, and as mentioned before, I'm currently the co-chair of the UN Secretary General's high-level advisory body on AI. Uh, this is a body that has 39 members from 33 countries drawn from different fields, academia, government, civil society, and the private sector. And uh, we, in December, we, we published our interim report and preliminary recommendations, and we're told this, we did this at record speed because we only had two and a half months to do this. Um, but the report highlights the opportunities as well as the risks of AI, but I think most importantly, also some of the gaps in capacity and governance, uh, especially in a way that includes everybody. Here, let me paraphrase uh, some of these gaps uh, from our report. First, that so far it is mostly well-resourced member states 
and some technology companies that have been able to invest the most in the critical aspects of AI, that is the compute, the data, the model development, as well as access. In addition to global shortages of crucial hardware, such as GPUs, there's also a dearth of top talent top technical talent in the field of AI. A second gap we highlight is that the AI opportunity arrives at an inopportune time, especially for the global south, where an AI divide lurks within a larger and still persistent digital and developmental divide. The basic foundations of a digital economy, such as broadband access, affordable devices and data, digital literacy, electricity, that is reliable and affordable, are not yet fully in place. Third, the report also highlights that there are governance gaps with respect to AI. Of the many initiatives that have emerged, including those by states, regions, and intergovernmental processes such as the EU, the G7, the G20, even the OECD, among others, many in the global south have not been involved despite potential impact on their lives. In fact, here I'm actually reminded of a uh, uh, public dialogue that I had with my friend uh, Strive Masiwa, and I want to quote what he, what he actually said as we were talking about the AI opportunities. Strive said the following, quote, we don't want to be users any more than we want to be used. We want to fully participate in the economic opportunity associated with AI. We have to be able to build our own enterprises. Our own entrepreneurs must feel that they are part of all of this, that we are creating prosperity, end of quote. Despite some progress, there's still so much more that can be done by all involved to address these uh, gaps. Uh, and I, I've just spoken about some of these, but this brings me to my fourth topic. What will it take for Africa to capitalize on the AI opportunity? As a general matter, I actually believe that African-led innovation initiatives will be key to capitalizing on the opportunities to meeting the challenges and addressing the gap. That's where I start. But here I want to be quite specific and highlight seven specific areas that I think are going to be critical for Africa. First, AI foundations. These are the core elements for any company, organization, country, or even government is going to need to have to be in AI. They include having enough compute, data, and data centers to build best-in-class AI models, access to the models, and model development by many, many more players, especially in Africa, uh, and expertise to drive innovation. This is critical. Number two, enabling infrastructure. This includes ubiquitous and affordable connectivity, digital infrastructure, even electricity. And here we're seeing in some encouraging progress, including Econet's groups, um, 100,000 kilometer of fiber optics, and we at Google have, have put out the Equiano C cable, which will help lower internet prices and increase speed. But much, much more is needed. Number three, skills and talent pipelines. These start with education and training to equip students with the right technical knowledge, all the way to skilling programs that support people already in the workforce. When it comes to innovation, Demand for African developers is already at an all-time high, driven by startup growth, rapid digitization by local businesses. The assistive use of AI can further expand the pool of African developers. Africa has a unique opportunity to tap and enable its rich demographic pipeline of young talent on the continent, and here I should add, in the diaspora too. Number four, a vibrant AI ecosystem. This is critical. In Silicon Valley, where I'm based, the AI's ecosystem includes research universities, entrepreneurs and startups, dynamic partnerships between startups and established companies, venture capital, the possibility of exits via IPOs or acquisitions or the capital markets, and access to very large markets. It'll be important to create such vibrant and dynamic AI ecosystems across Africa. Africa has no shortage of entrepreneurs with exciting ideas. But these other things are critical ingredients if they're going to succeed. We're starting to see such ecosystems emerge in some places in Africa, but not enough and not in, in, in enough places. 
Initiatives like the UNDP's Timbuktu Africa Innovation Fund, which I had the pleasure of participating at the launch of, which aims to mobilize and invest $1 billion to support African innovation ecosystem, are a good start. But again, more is needed and in many more places. Number five, partnerships at home and abroad. While it is important that Africa's approach to AI be Africa-led, Partnerships at home and abroad, especially with the private sector, will be critical to give initiative scale, enable distribution, as well as help provide infrastructure and financing leverage. Efforts like the Global, business, the Global Africa Business Initiative, which we have supported and brings together African and global business leaders to highlight the growth and, and business possibilities and opportunities across all sectors of African economy, are a good start. Number six, a continental scale market view. Now, this one is really, really important and is often underappreciated. Technology is about scale, especially market scale. In the context of the global economy and countries that have very large markets like India, China, and the United States, it is essential that Africa adopt a view of its opportunity beyond national boundaries and borders. This will not only help African entrepreneurs and businesses by giving them access to opportunities uh, in large enough markets of scale, but also as a way to attract financing. It's, you know, significant and committed capital is always seeking scale. So this really matters. Perhaps it's time to finally and fully realize the idea of a single digital common market across Africa. African heads of state took an encouraging first step towards this with the adoption of the digital protocol of the African continent of free trade area at the AU summit two weeks ago. I'm quite excited about that, but let's make it real. And finally, number seven, an affirmative and enabling policy agenda. None of the things I just listed happen in the absence of policies that enable the opportunities while also tackling the risks, challenging, and gaps. This is especially the case when it comes to investments in education and skilling, uh, digital infrastructure, AI foundations, support for entrepreneurs, including financing, as well as focus on important sectors in our economies and creation of an environment that encourages innovation, investments, and partnerships, and most importantly, again, scaling. What you, what you as leaders and countries choose to do here may, in the end, make all the difference. What we're seeing in Rwanda with, with its innovative national AI policy, in Mauritius with its national AI strategy, and in Nigeria and Kenya with the launch of their national AI processes, set a positive precedent for robust AI governance and frameworks and regulation. We hope to see this momentum continue across Africa so that more countries can be positioned to reap the benefits of AI. I've been quite heartened by some of the initiatives some countries are taking, and I look forward to engaging with some of you to learn more about your ongoing efforts. I would like to end by highlighting briefly what we at Google are doing to support Africa to capitalize on the AI opportunity. Since establishing our first office in Africa almost 17 years ago, when Google was only a little more than five years old as a company, Google has partnered with African leaders, communities, and entrepreneurs to help unlock economic opportunity and create jobs. In, two th in 2021, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, announced that Google would invest $1 billion over five years to support a range of initiatives to help boost Africa's digital transformation. Let me enumerate several areas we're focused on that uh, have a bearing on AI. Here again, I'll enumerate them. Number one, broadband infrastructure. Google bet early on Africa in 2005, just a year after Google's IPO. And we made our first big bet with the Seacom cable, followed recently by the state-of-the-art Equiano C cable. We're continuing with investments in new broadband technology such as Tara, which may help improve broadband cost effectiveness and inf expand infrastructure in, uh, possibilities across Africa. Number two. Google Cloud and AI Foundations. In 2022, we announced that we were expanding Google Cloud regions to five more country regional bases, including South Africa. The South African Cloud region could contribute more than a cumulative 2.1 billion to the country's GDP, 
and is expected to support the creation of more than 40,000 jobs by 2030. As our first cloud region in Africa, this brings our services and AI foundations and tools closer to developers, to startups, and other business, SMBs, and large enterprises in Africa, enabling them to innovate and securely deliver faster, more reliable experiences to their customers. And with respect to models, AI models that is, we not only offer API access to developers, but also recently announced Gemma, our state-of-the-art open model, which allows researchers and startups to make use of open models that are safe and state-of-the-art. Number three, AI research. Google Research, which is one of the teams and organizations that I oversee at Google, has established AI research labs in Accra, Ghana. We did this in 2018, and in Nairobi, Kenya in 2022, where our teams are working on advanced AI ML research with a specific focus on areas like food security, disaster management, and remote sensing. We've also signed research agreements with five universities, and we're excited to work with the incredible talent at these universities. Number six, in 2022, we announced a product development center in Nairobi, Kenya, the first of its kind in Africa, which is helping to create transformative products and services for people in Africa and around the world. Number five, startups. In 2018, we launched the Google for Startups Accelerator Africa. Since then, we've supported over 100 startups from 20 countries, providing them with access to Google Cloud, tools, technical expertise. In fact, the first cohort in our AI First program launched in 2023 includes startups working on building customer support tools for African businesses in transportation, healthcare, clean and clean energy, such as the Zimbabwean startup Need Energy. Number six, talent and skilling. To help close the digital divide, we've been offering career, certi career certificate programs in key areas such as UX design, data analytics, and cybersecurity. Already more than 20,000 Africans have graduated from our programs, and since 2017, Google has trained 6.4 million people across Africa with digital skills through our Grow with Google programs. In fact, we're, we're founding partners, as I mentioned before, of the Africa Masters in Machine Learning program, which also helps place students in research and in industry jobs. And finally, number seven, societal impact. We've been partnering and supporting African NGOs harnessing AI and technology for impact. Google.org, as I mentioned, has provided almost 100 million in support to nonprofit organizations working on these issues in Africa. Across all of these areas, we're working in collaboration and partnership with many African companies, NGOs, educational and training institutions, as well as Pan-African entities such as the African Development Bank and the UN Economic Commission for Africa, with whom we signed a landmark agreement last month for us to jointly deliver crucial computer science education for African students, startup development support, cybersecurity, AI training to policymakers across Africa. So let me conclude by saying the following. This is such an exciting opportunity for technology globally. It's also an exciting time for Africa. AI presents an extraordinary opportunity for Africa to make big leaps forward on empowering people, powering economic growth and prosperity, and advancing progress on pressing societal issues and development. The opportunity is too significant to ignore, and uh, believe me, others won't ignore it. At the same time, we should be clear-eyed on the challenges and the significant gaps that must be addressed if Africa is to fully capitalize on its AI opportunity. While we do not have all the answers, I've tried to highlight at least some seven areas that I think require urgent focus. Addressing these gaps and capturing the opportunity that AI presents will require ingenuity, investments, and partnerships. At Google, we're excited to be a partner in, in Africa's transformation journey, contributing to the vision of AI for Africa by Africa, where Africans are leading the creation of AI ecosystems, products, and solutions, and African businesses and their governments are capitalizing on the transformational po possibilities of AI. I urge you to collaborate across governments and Pan-African institutions, academia, and the private sector, and to develop comprehensive AI policy frameworks that strike the balance between risk management and innovation, a framework that enables Africa to leap into the future. Adopting such a framework across the continent will position us to seize the significant opportunities offered by AI 
whilst mitigating the risks. The time to do so is now. Coming here today has prompted me to think back to my time as an undergraduate at the University of Zimbabwe and my initial steps into AI research. Then artificial neural networks were a speculative area of research. Now students in Harare and across the continent are on the precipice of a time of transformational change. In fact, while I've been here, I met some young people here like Sandra Shoko, who's smart, excited, ambitious, and we also heard uh, the students who sang to us this morning. Theirs is the talent, potential, and the future that we must enable and unleash. Let's not fail them. Thank you.